This is News and Notes. I'm Farai Chidea. We're taking a look at the battles over race and gay rights launched by California's Proposition 8. With us, Gary Gates, a demographer at the University of California, Los Angeles, Patrick Salmon, national president of the Log Cabin Republicans, and Ron Buckmeyer, board president of the Barbara Jordan Bayard Rustin Coalition. Hi, gentlemen. How are you? Good to be with you. Nice to be with you, Farai. So, Ron, I'm going to start um, with you, what's your assessment of of how this issue has played out so far in terms of, you know, bringing together the issues of of race and sexual orientation, but also just the anger that's that's expressed? Well, it's been a hurricane basically since Proposition Eight passed. Well, since Proposition Eight passed and the exit poll was released, of uh, showing the CNN exit poll was released showing that seventy percent of African-Americans voted for Proposition 8. Um, there are still some questions about whether how accurate that poll is. I Because in that poll, it also says that the African-American electorate is 10%, which is a very iffy number. African-Americans make up 6% of the uh, population in California. But regardless, um, it is pretty clear that African-Americans voted for Proposition 8, voted to eliminate the fundamental right to marry for same-sex couples at a high, much higher rate than any other ethnic group in Los a- in California. And that's very, very distressing, especially to people like me who are in both groups, are black and are gay. Why do you think that black voters um, were the most likely to vote for Prop 8? I think it's complicated. I think it shows that there is a lot of work that the um, gay groups need to do, and also, frankly, the gay black groups uh, need to do um, to reach out to the African-American population to make them realize that Proposition 8 was not about religion. It was about a civil marriage ceremony. It was about a fundamental right. And passing Proposition 8 was an incredibly horrible precedent. People of California said they were going to just reach out and rip out a right that had been granted by the Supreme Court of California and then 173 days later basically divorced me and, you know, 18,000 other couples like myself who had gotten married in the interregnum. When you think about um, this issue, Patrick, your group, Log Cabin Republicans, has been um, a group that, that Obviously, you're Republicans, but you've also had some differences with, for example, the party platform. How did you come down on Prop 8, and then what did you do as a group in in addressing it? Well, we were one of the first national gay rights organizations to support marriage equality back in the early 90s. And so we were obviously very much against uh, Proposition 8, and we were proud that Governor Schwarzenegger at our national convention in April came out against any constitutional amendment to roll back marriage. We actually had a a campaign, Republicans Against Eight, which complemented the broader No on Eight campaign, where we were working to get Republicans opposing Prop 8. You know, the thing that's so unfortunate to me about what's happened here is it shouldn't be blaming anyone. I would hope that what our community goes through is figuring out why we lost and changing our strategy next time to make sure it doesn't happen. So it really is awful that any group is being blamed. I mean, 84 percent of Republicans voted yes. They should be blamed. You know, the one, a couple numbers that stuck out in my mind was 38 percent of the yes votes were Barack Obama supporters. And so that just shows us that we need to make progress with Democrats and independents and Republicans. And then another group, 84 percent of ch- uh, weekly churchgoers voted yes on Prop 8. So rather than pointing fingers at anyone. I think we just need to look at the numbers and understand where and how we need to do better in the future, both in California and other states. What do you think um, is the next step for a group like yours who, you know, you can sit down with the governor, you can have a conversation, and Governor Schwarzenegger himself has has changed over time on how he addressed uh, the issue. But there's going to, we're going to talk more uh, about what the future strategies are, but where are you going from here specifically? Well, at the end of the day, equality is impossible to achieve without Republican votes. And unfortunately, the outcome here in California showed that. So we're committed to continuing to work with inside the Republican Party to make it better. Even with bigger Democratic majorities in Congress, 
they're going to need Republican votes to pass a lot of that legislation, particularly in the Senate, where you need a filibuster-proof majority. So we're committed to doing the difficult work. We know we're making progress with rank-and-file Republicans. On an issue like Don't Ask, Don't Tell, way back in 1993, only 32 percent of Republicans favored allowing gays and lesbians to serve in the military. Now that number's up to 64 percent. So there's no question we're making progress, but the results here in California certainly show how much work still needs to be done. Do you think black people are more homophobic than white people? An issue that's come up many times. I think the, the no, I do not think that. And I think the great response to that is a, um, I think of my friend Keith Boykin, who wrote a famous blog post t- entitled, Why Are White People So Homophobic? And he talks about, there's so many examples, for example, at the time it was um, the head of the um the military, uh, Peter Pace, talking about how he he didn't accept um, gays in the military, that he, it was just wrong. It was, his, it was his more religious views. There are so many more examples of white people saying homophobic things than there are black people saying homophobic things. It's just, it's just fascinating to me that people sort of get caught up in this strange meme that, quote unquote, black people are more homophobic, when really homophobia happens in all communities. How do people, in your experience that, that you've met, prioritize what they believe in when it comes to a situation like this that is a social values issue? I, I simply can't understand it myself how, and I've, and I've spoken with people who are, you know, college professors <laughs> and are religious, and they know that we're talking about civil marriage, we're, we're ta- we're, it has nothing to do with going to a church, but yet they say, you know, my pastor says I have to vote yes on Proposition 8, and that's what they do. I mean, so it, clearly they are prioritizing one particular identity over another. But part, another part of your question, which sort of raises my hackles, is this question about, well, which are you first? Are you black? Are you gay? Are you gay? Are you black? And it sort of it denies the idea that one can be both simultaneously. It's like asking Barack Obama, which is he, black or white, white or black? He is both. Patrick, what's um, when you think about the the response to this. There have been protests all over the country, some of them tense, some of them very specific, like this person gave this money to this part of the Yes on 8 coalition. We're going to protest in front of this business, some of them much more general. One of the things that came up over the course of the past eight years was with anti-war protest, is protest still an effective form of civil interaction. From your perspective as someone who watches politics, do you think these protests are accomplishing what they set out to do? Well, as a Republican, I'm more conservative, so protests are never high on my list. But I have to say, for myself even, my reaction to this passage of Prop 8 has been anger. And so I can understand why people want to do something to show their anger. I think our challenge going forward as a, as a movement working toward equality for all is how we, within the next few weeks, transfer that anger into positive momentum to move forward. Because at the end of the day, anger won't get us any closer to achieving where we want to go. So what we need to do is, again, figure out why we lost and get more people involved. I wish there would have been people marching before the vote. I wish there would have been more people working phone banks and knocking on doors. And I know a lot of people did all that they could to try and defeat eight, but it's a bit frustrating in my mind that there wasn't this activism before the vote. So what we have to do is make use of the energy and the anger and move forward in a positive way rather than just throwing rocks.